Okay. So hi, hello, and welcome, everyone. My name is Max Williams. I am the Child Life Technology Specialist at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. Um, I am joined by my colleagues, uh, Alex Pereira, uh, Elena Guerra, Guerrera um, from Methodist Children's in Texas, uh, Mark Compass from Cohen Children's on Long Island, uh, and Andrew Way from Dell Children's in Texas as well. Um, uh, and this is the importance of the one-on-one -on -one bedside gaming session. So let's get right on into it. Um, just a little bit about myself. I, uh, uh, Max Williams, uh, I'm at the Child Life Technology Specialist at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. Um, I have a BA in music. Uh, I have a background in the music and education world, um, and that's going to be important later, I promise. Um, I started in May 2019, uh, so three years and change, um, and I'm the only patient tech um, at Yale New Haven Children's. Uh, we have 202 beds, and if you take away the 68-bed NICU, um, I service 134 beds across all the units, which is uh, neuroepilepsy, short stay, surgery, general medicine, uh, hematology, oncology, uh, PICU, uh, the cardiac ICU, and our two, uh, or a bunch of outpatient clinics. Um, as of July 1st, 2022, I had seen 6,640 patients, um, or rather had a capacity for patient and family impact. We call that a CPFI. Um, that number seems really high, but even if I uh, drop off a phone charger to a family, um, that counts as the capacity for impact. So, um, uh, like I said, the number seems high, but it's mainly to show you how uh, the scope of the position uh, can reach a lot uh, of people and do a lot of good. Um, among uh, the 6,000, uh, over 2,000 of those were hemonc patients and 500 in the PICU, so we also see um, a, a lot of acute patients too. Um, and just a little about the nature of our work, uh, it's a brand new industry. We are tiny little babies, uh, patient techs. Um, we're, we're just getting started. There are dozens of us, <laughs> um, and we come from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, and because of that, uh, the paths we can take as professionals um, uh, it can, you know, vary a lot depending on what the hospital's vision for uh, you, uh, you is, you are, um, and uh, what your background is. Um, so we've kind of hammered out three unofficial types of patient techs. There's the patient-focused uh, patient techs. Those are the ones that really focus on the time spent with patients and social interactions and how video games can um, benefit that. Um, then there's the project focus, which they kind of um, focus on uh, efficiency projects and various things to, uh, you know, improve their child life department and also the experience of their patients. And then, of course, the hybrid, which kind of uh, split it 50-50. Uh, so the the uh, a lot of different roles is where my background um, comes in. Uh, I'm, I was a music educator for a little while. Um, that that was what I went to school for. And my colleagues also come from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, so it's important to uh, kind of uh, play on your strengths. But I uh, truly believe that the core of our practice is using video games. Um, for the 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 one on one bedside interactions, um, uh, I feel like I'm talking with like minded individuals. I don't need to get into the science of how video games can help. We all know, uh, you know, the myth of video games causing violence and and all that stuff. Um, but uh, uh, the 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 bedside gaming really is the, what I consider the bread and butter of what we do. Um, and there are what we've identified as two types of bedside gaming sessions. Um, there's the clinical referral where the care team reaches out to the child life team. Um, for uh, a medical reason or something like that. Uh, and then there's also the casual agenda-free hangout where we're just spending time with a patient. That's good for really long-term patients. Um, uh, and it's good for anxiety, pain relief, normalization, distraction, all those key um, child life benefits. Um, uh, and, and I truly believe that uh, a, a well-trained GTS or a, a gaming tech specialist with a, with a gaming console uh, is the easiest way uh, to, to reach a hard to reach patient. Um, it's, it's great that uh, we can create inroads with, with hard to reach patients and uh, also just um, kind of spread the love of gaming and the, and the good it can do. Um, it's something unique we can provide. Um, so I will pass it off to my colleagues uh, to kind of get into the meat and potatoes of that. So thank you guys so much. Yeah, so hi, I'm Alexander Pereira. I am one of the two patient technology specialists at Methodist Children's Hospital down in San Antonio. Um, I have a master's of education technology with a focus on games and education. Doesn't help as much as you'd expect, but still sounds fun. Um, I started in January of 2018. So I'm one of the long running kind of like been around for a while. Um, and our program is one of the earlier patient tech programs out there. Um, my estimated rough annual patient, what we call patient touches, but it's the same principle as what Max was talking about is about 1,900 patients for me personally. Um, we have about 96 beds. 
and we serve pediatric surgery, pediatric ICU, pediatric intermediary care, hemoc oncology and BMT units, as well as our CCBC, which is our cancer and blood clinic. I can never get that right. Um, and we work really closely with our rehab uh, teams to help ensure patients are meeting their goals on the rehab end. Um, and I'm actually going to go ahead and touch on more specific, like a little dive a little deeper on what the types of bedside sessions we've decided are. If Max will bump back over. There we go. So like Max was saying, we have two real distinct types of bedside intervention that we do. The first is clinical referrals. And these, while they still maintain a, like a core part of it is normalization, morale building, and rapport building. These are core functions to how these work. These are very focused. Um, at Methodist Children's, we do some of this with our rehab more than anybody else. But I know like Mark will be able to touch a little bit more on, there are other things beyond just rehab that you can do these things with. But um, what, we're talk what we're focusing on is improving compliance with medication, improving compliance with post-surgical goals, especially ambulating, things like that. Um, frequently it's working with uh, rehab or with, uh, child life as basically being the carrot for like patient needs to make sure they're filling out their medicine sticker chart and if they fill it out we promise them that Alexander or Elena you guys will come visit them and play video games and so it becomes a matter of I come in every day and I go hey how are we doing on that sticker chart we've done it for behavior compliance as well um, patient needs to not be mean and nasty and grumpy to the nursing staff and if they're good they get to visit with us. Um, these are all very bedside interventions with a goal. The other side of this is critical to being able to do the clinical referrals. It is uh, casual, what we're calling casual agenda-free hangouts. This is me or Elena coming by and being like, hey, uh, I heard you like video games. Um, or I know you like Mario Kart. I'm supposed to beat you at Mario Kart today. Um, and we're just there to hang out, to play games, to build rapport, um, we're still doing important work. We're still normalizing the hospital environment, building rapport, um, especially for long-term patients. We're uh, boosting their morale um, for kiddos who have been there for five or six days, two months, seven months. It's really important that we come through and visit and hang out and play games. Um, and our general, for both of these timeframes, uh, we say they last about 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes they go longer, sometimes they go shorter. It really depends on the situation with the patient and with the teams you're working with. But with casual, it's very much about like, we're going to play whatever game you feel like. Sometimes clinical, it's like, no, get up. We're going to do just dance. Like rehab is here. You've got to stand up and we've got to keep you moving. Um, but casual is very much about building that flow through. Go ahead. So we're going to touch on some patient impact stories. Um, Elena couldn't make it to today's scheduling stuff got in the way. Uh, so we've got a rather long video that Max is going to skip around to see if we can highlight some of, she has one of the best stories we've had um, in a little bit, but we were going to touch a little bit on patient impact here. Um, two of these photos, the right two photos are from her kiddo that she's going to talk about. The left one is from, uh, one of the kiddos I worked with, uh, and we'll touch more on like the D&D side of things uh, in a later panel with Adam and Garrett. And then Elena uh, is our second patient technology specialist at Methodist Children's. Um, she has a BFA in communication design, um, just highlighting again, that very different background. The really cool thing is she's been here just about, just over a year. She has seen 2,300 patients. Her patient touch number is 2,300. Um, and that, what, what's that allowed me to do is my patient number has stayed around 1,800, but she has managed to see a, even more patients than me. Um, and that's freed us up to do a little bit more project work or background work or spend more time with different kiddos. Um, and it's been huge having two of us on site. So real quick, while we were talking about uh, patient impact, um, I uh, 
a particularly memorable um, impact was a letter written by a family. Um, I, I wanted to pick this one out because uh, this was just from one interaction. So while we have those long-term patients um, where we can really build those close relationships with to help them through long-term stays, um, even just a one-off session can really have a big impact. So I just wanted to quickly read you this letter from this great family. This is my buddy, uh, Reed. Um, uh, sometimes thank you isn't enough to adequately express our gratitude. Our son is nine years old and has endured 16 various surgeries and procedures related to his multiple chronic conditions. Surgery in a hospital stay is frightening for any child, but the anxiety and fear are compounded when a child has had to endure what our son has gone through. It is also emotionally exhausting for the parents. The child life specialist mentioned that patients could request game consoles in their room and that there was even a dedicated gamer to play with them. For the first time in days, he wasn't focused on his surgery. Instead, he was focused on the new gaming system he was going to get to try after the surgery. Even walking into the OR, he was calm and chatting about the system and the games he wanted to try. Distraction is such a beautiful thing at times like these. The gaming system offered a great distraction from the pain, discomfort, and inability to leave the bed. But the linchpin came on Monday when you came into the room to play some games with him. It is an understatement to say that it had been a terrible morning. When he saw you, he got an instant smile on his face, the first of the day. Even the nurse commented that Max might just be the medicine your son needs. For that time, he was completely focused on playing the game and talking about things other than medicine. I believe the time you spent with him changed the trajectory of his day and thus helped his recovery. So that's my little buddy. And so this is actually a, a follow-up visit a couple years later. So this is him doing well just for a checkup. Um, and we took an updated picture. Our first picture was taken um, without Matt's son, but I thought our, you know, this seems a little bit uh, better. I, I like it. Um, so anyway, um, Alex, would you like to go back and uh, check out what Elena had to say before we move on? Yeah, let's let's cut a little bit. Of sure, the... let's poke through this video. Hello, my name is Elena Guerra, and I'm a patient technology specialist at the Children's Hospital, Hospital in San Antonio, San Antonio Texas. Max, meet your mic. I became a patient tech about a year ago, uh, and I'm here to tell you about my experience very early on into that time frame where I had a buddy uh, that showed me just how impactful, meaningful, and important a patient tech specialist program can be in the hospital environment. It was about my second week at work, and I was consulted to see a four-year-old BMT transplant patient. It was before a transplant, so he was he was kind of feeling he was fine for somebody who's you know prepping to go through the transplant. Uh, when I popped in and introduced myself and my services, he agreed to play Mario Kart with me. We played Mario Kart, and at the end of our session, uh, my friend ended up throwing a tantrum, and so I dismissed myself after asking if mom needed anything and left afterwards. He, the next couple of weeks, um, our patient tech specialist had gone on vacation, so it was just me. I was very nervous uh, to still do bedside interactions. It's, it's only like my third week at this point, and I'm fresh into the field and the hospital setting. Um, but when I went to go see if um, my friend that we had just talked about wanted bedside interactions, he he was going through the like the worst part of transplant and so he didn't feel well. Um, so understandably, they said no. One of the times I did ask after that, however, when he did look like he didn't want anything to do with me because he was on his tablet, mom was the one who said, actually, you know what, no, go ahead and set up your gaming cart. So I set up my gaming cart for him and I asked if she wanted me to try and get him to play games um, or if she wanted me to play a game for him. And she said, try playing a game for him and maybe he'll be interested in it. So I booted up a game called Beyond Blue, which is an indie game made by Eline Media in which you are a marine biologist named Mirai and you are exploring uh, the ocean following a pot of sperm whales in your research. This game is super great because it's very chill. You don't have to worry about jump scares or breathing timers while being underwater. All you do is literally explore the beauty that the ocean has to offer while learning about fish and other wildlife that are down there. So as I played through the first level, which is a coral leaf level, and they have things like tiger sharks, they have sea turtles, they have all sorts of really fun creatures to look at. 
I'm stating some of the fish facts out loud to him, regardless of whether or not he's looking at me. It's still trying to do, to put on that show for him. Um, at one point during the session, I caught him in the corner of my eye, looking away from his tablet onto my cart's TV screen. I stopped and I looked at him and he did that thing that kids do when they've been caught doing a thing they don't want you to know they're doing. Um, and when I looked at him and he caught me looking at him, he promptly just, and I was like, okay. So we went back to playing the game. And after that session, I left. The next time I saw him, he was the one who said yes, he wanted to, he wanted me to play the game for him. Um, I set the game back up and we did the same thing. Uh, with the, the great thing about Beyond Blue is it's all the same area of the ocean. Each level or the progress that you make is a different depth of the ocean. So you see different types of fish and a different kind of environment, but it's the same. So it's a familiar feeling. You don't have to worry about any jump scares or anything like that. Throughout this time, he was going through the lowest of his lows with his transplant. And so he was very selective in who he spoke with. Um, noticing that he tended to favor yes or no questions, I began formatting my questions in those ways to try and make communicating with me easier. Um, but at one point while playing the game, he there was a point where I couldn't format it in a yes or no question. And so I instead used number signs with options. So it'd be like, do, would you want to watch this? Would you, would you want to watch the educational videos? Do you want to do another level? Do you want to look at the fish? You know, stuff like that. And he would mimic and uh, let me know what he wanted. Um, so through there, we were able to get through the game, complete it. Um, and eventually he was, when he started feeling on the up and up from his transplant, uh, we he picked Super Smash Bros. He didn't know what was going on with Super Smash Bros. He saw that brother had been playing it. Um, didn't know how to play it, but by the time we started, we finished playing it, he was giggling so loud, he was screaming so loud out of joy and laughter that everybody knew he was having fun. I shortly became his favorite at that point, um, and everybody knew it. Uh, to the point where, and this this was actually made very apparent um, when we had a PR shoot come through, and our other patient tech had been grabbed for the shoot because our PR lady just knew him better and had his direct line of communication. I had just started, so I understood. Um, but when he came back to the room, I had asked like, hey, how did my friend do during the shoot? And he said, um, I guess he's just not feeling well today. I was like, why is he not feeling well? In my brain, I just played with him, I think, the day before. So he should be okay unless something changed with him. Uh, and he said, no, like, he just didn't want to cooperate with the photo shoot. And I was like, that's very strange. I was like, okay, thank you for letting me know. So I go upstairs. Because I'm concerned at this point. This is my, my homie, like, we hang out very regularly. Um, and I pop my head in. And he smiled and mom was like, hi, good morning. I was like, hi, how did the shoot go? And the mom said, oh, it was okay. He didn't really end up wanting to do it. I was like, okay, like I was told that he just wasn't feeling well. And the mom laughed and was like, no, Lena, because it wasn't you. He doesn't know the other person. And I was like, okay. I was, and I asked mom if she still wanted him featured. Um, and to which she said that would be nice. Um, but... I couldn't, so there was a point where during his stays, I'd have to consult with the nursing team um, before I went into the room because his blood pressure would rise as soon as he saw me. So it was like a whole coordination thing. And the moment he saw me, he'd get super excited. So I'd have to offer the game session to him unless it was like a bingo day and that's separate. Um, so we did a small game session and then I went to go find the PR team to say like, hey, like, mom would like if you guys tried one more time with the pictures he thinks anybody who comes in is gonna poke him or is gonna do something to him just because he's been through so much so we have to go about it this way mom has already consented to the photos um you have to kind of make it look like you're talking to mom 
in order to get it to be where he's not, he doesn't see you as a threat or he doesn't think you're gonna do something to him. So when we went back in, I gave him the controller and I asked him if he wanted to do some more gaming, which he was very cooperative and said yes. I was very pleased to see that our PR team was able to get pictures of him um, so that way they, it, he could be featured, which our friend deserved it. He fought really hard and he was, he had gone through so much that he definitely deserved his moment in the spotlight. So that's a great story. Yeah, and it's worth noting that some of the photos we showed in that very first set of photos are some of the photos that they were able to grab. Um, if Max can get there. <laughs> were some of the photos they were able to grab. Um, and by the end of the stay, uh, like she was flat out his favorite person. Um, we're going to have to elide a little bit of Elena's story. It's a really solid story. Um, and... We'll definitely make sure that video and these slides are available in however way, just so you guys can see her tell her the end of her story. Absolutely, and shout out to Elena for getting that together for us so quickly with that uh, scheduling mishap. So yeah, good, good work, Elena. Excellent, excellent work. So uh, yeah, let's move right along. Oh, hello, hello. <laughs> All right, and uh, introducing my colleague Mark Compass. Hey guys, hello everyone. I'm Mark. Um, I am a chat life specialist and game tech. Um, so I will be kind of diving in a little bit into um, basically why these one-on-one uh, -on -one bedside interactions can be so impactful. Um, I love hearing these stories. So we'll just kind of touch a little bit on, you know, some things on why those things, you know, how why they're effective and I'll just talk a little bit quickly about me. Um, basically, I studied a little bit of electrical engineering and computer science before finding my way into the child life field. So I do have some tech background. And as I got into this field, I quickly noticed and my you know directors and supervisors would notice like, hey, you got some tech skills. That's pretty useful. Um, <laughs> so I was child life specialist. Um, just just child life for about three years. Um, and as I was moving through there, I became per diem at a children's hospital just one day a week. Um, but two years, um, two years ago, I shout out to Child's Play. I got a um, position grant for, uh, for two years and they helped me be full time in the hospital rather than my one day, even though just one day, was a bit impactful going full time really let the hospital see like whoa this is something that we need and i'm happy to say they took me on after seeing all the great work that we can do um and just to let you guys know because all of our game tech positions they are so different in how we have our workload distributed um basically i am the hybrid position that was mentioned earlier um most of my time is uh, 50%, it's, it's like half my time is is maintenance. I am part of a 30 plus child life team. Um, and we have like a, it's about a 200 plus bed hospital. Um, so I have a lot of stuff that we got to take care of, consoles and rooms, um, iPads throughout across the team and all gaming laptops, all the things. Um, we also have a CCTV channel um, that we, I helped develop from just like a one day a week, one, uh, one live show per week and one person team. Now we have a five person team and live shows five days a week. So a lot of my time was spent towards that. Um, then I try to sprinkle in some special events like gaming events, gaming groups and things like that. And then I got my, what I love to do the most is my one-on-one -on -one patient interactions. So it does break down to about just about 10%, but, with all those things in mind, I interact uh, over the past two years. I was able to record all the data. And I had about 3,000 patient interactions for the two uh, full-time years. And that is including like CCTV interactions. So it it is a pretty big number. But you know, when you have bingo and like there's 30 kids watching, that does count as 30. So that just gives you an idea of how my distribution goes. 
Um, but to dive into, you know, basically a, a lot of the parts that we like to look at, especially as a child life specialist, these are these are very familiar terms that most of us are used to seeing. And and uh, everyone has kind of discussed a few of these terms. So they should look somewhat familiar to you guys. Um, but I think one of the, the biggest pieces of what we do and our one-to-one -one interactions really helps out with is, is empowerment, right? Um, basically, when a kid comes to the hospital, they feel a tremendous loss of power and control, right? Their, their whole routine has changed. They have to abide by certain rules, new, new, new things that they have to do, take meds at a certain time. They have to do blood work and all these things. They really don't have the same freedom and choices like they used to. So reestablishing some sort of thing where they do have control, where they do have choices. Um, us as game techs can really dive in and just give them choices, right? Like we, the main thing is putting the kid in the driver's seat, right? And and what choices can they make, right? Um, Elena had a really good example in her story where she, where the kid was, you know, communicating on what he wanted her to do in the games, right? You can. A kid doesn't even have to be playing the game for you to empower them, right? They can be playing, you can be playing for them, right? And that gives them all those choices and control, right? So it helps them feel like they're in the driver's seat again. And not only that, but like when you're playing with them too, um, Elena talked about he wanted to explore Smash Brothers and he never played it before, but you know what? They played it together and he started getting better at it and and that is also very empowering for those patients so that that is something that helps them feel like they're in control and and choices that we can give even as small as like which game do you want to pick do you want me to come later do you want to play now do you want to play together do you want to do it by yourself do you want me to play for you more choices is <laughs> yeah smash brothers definitely definitely a solid game to play but um, more choices is is definitely really helpful. Um, yeah, and so also another another huge thing um, that we also talked about a lot is is normalization and and um, basically patients are in an unfamiliar territory. They are not at home, far from home, and this experience is definitely different from home, I think that's safe to say, right? So what can we do to help them feel more at home? And with video games, that is something that I think brings a level of comfort from home to the hospital, right? Like these kids on average are spending at least a half hour to an hour a day on games, if not more. I think that's a low number, especially my numbers as a kid, right? So. Having some kind of gaming is awesome, even if it's just for a little bit of time. And that helps them feel more at home. You know, even if, if you have their like favorite game, that is, you know, that that is something that they can just take them out of their room and into their, you know, safe space, their their comfort zone. And as game techs, we have, you know, a whole library of, of different games. Child's Play, you know, they have this, this excellent gaming guide that has specific things, games that for specific tasks, like if their long-term stays, if they're feeling anxiety, you know, all these things can help with normalizing their experience. And, and that also ties into how socialization can help normalize their experience too, right? Gaming, especially nowadays, hardly can be a one player experience. Like online gaming is pretty much just how it is now, right? So um, that level of socialization is amazing to bring to kids. Like if they're isolated and they can't leave their rooms, then gaming is one way that they can still reach out and be, be um, present with their social circles. Yes, Fortnite, you know, like just gaming together and and being together with friends, even though you're not physically together, can be super powerful in lifting their spirits and helping them not feel isolated when they're in their room. And if they're on, you know, isolation precautions and they can't leave their room, 
it's one of their real only outs that not only is comfort comfortable from you know like that home experience but it just helps them be connected and feel not so isolated you know and i think one of the other big factors is also not only can they connect with friends but that connection with staff right us as um, game techs we get to connect with them right and and we get to build that that rapport you know and it's no surprise that we can sometimes become uh, like later said like their favorite right and and max was also um i think in that letter they said uh max was the medicine that he needed right like they're 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 so there's so much power in being able to connect with them in in their comfort zone that like we can create these strong connections that when they're not feeling alone they they have higher spirits they and and when they're feeling better about themselves and and the situation that they're in you know they're usually more likely to comply with other staff and and there's there's a lot to be shown about just you know having higher spirits really helps that healing process too um and yeah so let's see these other two items that i'll, I'll touch on briefly too um is as game techs we also can help a lot with the stress management and frustration tolerance too um it's pretty easy to say that this is not an easy experience for for patients you know it's sometimes a lot of the times the, their most challenging experience in their life up to this time in their life right and it's it takes a special special place to really help with this and and growing in this right we can either come out can come out of this with new coping skills and a way to look at things in a new perspective to really take on our challenges or we can get stuck in our you know poor me and and our struggles and that downward spiral you know and as game techs you know we we can help with some of that stress management right like when they're going through a game and say we're we're, we're playing playing together playing some mario and we get into this one level and this this one part just we can't get past it right and what do you got what can you do you know and as adults when we have faced with a challenge one thing that we can do is just come up with a plan all right you know what we keep doing this let's let's figure out how to do this a certain different way you go that way i go this way and we come up with a plan and we can conquer this level maybe right and then this is great because it can be translated into their hospital experience too when say all right you know what you're getting this blood draw and you know as a child life specialist we'll come up with a plan with these patients you know so it's it's a nice tie-in like hey you know this worked for us in the game let's see if it works for us in our experience right and that is that is a great thing and and even just taking deep breaths with with our patient right you know like sometimes you just got to pause take a deep breath all right let's do it you know what oh you know what we're, we're, we're there's there's only one group left we are gonna win this we, we're not gonna get second place this time but first before we charge in let's pause all right let's do it you know like taking that pause in the game will also remind them hey you know what i'm, I'm nervous about this procedure coming up but you know i can pause and remember that just taking a deep breath can really just get you in the right mindset um but yeah and then you know i i touched on it basically before rapport building oh uh sorry skip something in my notes also developmental stimulation is another thing that we can uh touch on a little bit um as game techs you know um when when they're playing a game we can just engage them in their their comfort zone like this is this is something that they like to do and it keeps their mind active um but something that is is worth noting also is is even with our these special needs patients like this is something gaming is and and ipads or what or apps and whatever they like to use or something worth exploring too right and 
something you want to just be mindful of is, you know, what what developmental age are are these patients? Would you say they're at? And also knowing like what triggers they might have before you go into their room um, helps you, you know, engage them in their comfort zone, right? Um, Elena also talked about how her patient was. Um, really only like to answer yes or no questions. And she catered to that experience by, you know, asking more yes or no questions to just get them to open up more. And that that's also an ex another example of how, you know, engaging in the patient's comfort zone can really help with building that connection. Um, and it, it can also be challenging to connect with like nonverbal patients, you know, but if you're gaming together with them and, and really engaging them in, in their, what they like to do. Um, you know, it helps them really increase their attention and focus. And that can be a, you know, super powerful thing too. Um, yeah, so I guess I will jump into quickly um, the, the case study that I would like to um, talk about with my experience. Um, this was just a, you know, a typical agenda-free referral, you know, no no clinical goals or anything. Um, just a uh, child life specialist said, hey, you know, there's this patient, adolescent male. Um, he's been pretty distant. Um, he had, um, I think, I believe he was in a, in a car accident. So he had some sort of injury where he lost the use of his hands. Um, and he was just kind of bummed out. People weren't really connecting with them and they're like hey can you can you go see him and you know just see if you can engage him and if he's interested in anything you know and so basically i was like all right yes you know i'll i'll, I'll fix these uh just got to fix these two ipads and update this laptop then run this show and then <laughs> i can probably see them after the gaming group and so i finally made my way over there um and you know um Adolescent males, always not always the uh, most open, but I, you know, stood there and we we connected on a few things. He was an anime fan, so that was that was easy and for me. And after we got talking for a little bit, you know, he I was like, hey, you know, uh, we got some gaming stuff if you're into anything. And he was like, yeah, I am, but you know, obviously. You know, he's like, you know, my deal, I can't really use my hands right now. Um, I don't think I can do that. And I'm like, well, you know, lucky for you, we have the Oculus and there are some games that you could actually play hands free. And he was like, really? No way. I'm like, yeah, you know, there's this really cool game. Um, I believe it's called Rush. It's like this, uh, it's like um, kind of like skydiving and racing mixed into one and what's cool about this game is you can have uh control it with your hands if you're holding the controllers or if you do hands free you just look and use use uh your gaze to steer um around and and it's it's also pretty cool because like you're you know you're flying through the sky there's scenery and and um it's super easy to use so he's like, all right, you know what? I mean, that's not, that's not really a typical game that he played, but he dove into it and uh, literally, and he, um, he loved it. He loved it. He like, we were gaming for like a good hour and, and like, it was the first time I saw him smile on his face, you know, and, and uh, coming out of that, he, he saw like, it was like a light bulb in his head that like, hey, you know what? I can still do some of the things that I do did before, like, but you know, I just have to do them different, a little differently, maybe, you know. And we we talked a lot about that, and and there's there's so much out there with with adaptive and accessibility that, um, you know, it really got him excited about, like, you know what? Instead of me looking at this as a loss of something, he's now starting to explore the things that he can maybe do now. So it, it gave him, it empowered him, and it gave him like a new sense of independence. Mark, we got five minutes, so we'll jump over yeah. to Andrew. Yeah, yeah, so so that's it for my piece. And, and now I'll uh, introduce Andrew, who's gonna speak a little more to um, the more the project-oriented side. 
Hi, yes, so my name is Andrew. I'm gonna speed through this real quickly to hopefully catch up and get some questions in. So very quickly, I'm the patient technology coordinator at Dell Children's Medical Center in Austin, Texas. Our bedside is currently at 248 beds. We're about to add another tower of 72 beds. I see about 200 of those beds and that covers inpatient and outpatient. My education is in psychology, but I had a minor in informatics. And what that really meant was I had a focus on bridging technology and human design and interaction. So I wasn't really focused on the psychology piece, but how to use it in technology. Um, so far, I've been here for about a year. 70% of my time is typically spent on projects and 30% is on patients. So that's kind of why I have a little lower of a patient interaction number as the rest of these guys. Um, but that's a quick blurb. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why project work is important, just because we've covered a lot of the patient work. So um, it's also going to preface, I'm gonna preface this with, there's a little bit of controversy around like, is patient work more important or is project work more important? And honestly, there is no good answer. We all kind of have a no one size fits all approach and it's all dependent on our hospital needs, which is why I've kind of used the chicken and the egg analogy. So because we don't really know which one is needed first, you kind of have the egg, which is the projects that are the projects that you do to set up the network, to get the game consoles in the hospital, to get specific video games for patients, all the way to projects that kind of work on the application of, can you host a Minecraft server? Do you want to have an organization from outside the hospital come in and then play with kids? And then on the chicken side, I'm calling us the chickens, the patient text is the chicken, because we are the people who use the tools that are video game consoles and everything that we try to get into the hospital. And without those kind of tools, we can't really do our job as effectively. We can do our job just by talking, but I think, you know, video game systems are our bread and butter kind of tech tool. Um, and so with technology, one of my biggest examples is when I got here, we got a massive donation of Xboxes that went into every single one of our patient rooms. That number will soon be about 160 rooms with Xboxes installed in the room that will be available for patients with no need for setup on our end or on their end. It's all set up with Game Pass and Disney Plus, so it kind of meets this whole entertainment need. And with that setup, it kind of lets me do patient sessions a lot quicker and a lot more consistently. And I don't really have to worry about finding a go-kart or we don't have to really find where Nintendo Switch is. It's just kind of in the room ready to be used. And that also goes for, you know, child life staff and nursing staff and anyone else in the hospital where they can just kind of use this equipment that's available to them. They don't have to worry about how to use it. Just kind of, wait, they don't need to know how the technology works. They just need to know how to use it and apply it. And then lastly, this whole idea of projects advocates for the five WH to the hospital. Uh, WH stands for uh, who uses the technology, what is it used for, where is it gonna be used, when is it gonna be used, why is it used, and how is it used? So you got all those questions of kind of like around technology. It's a little bit, it's a little bit broad, but it kind of helps lay that foundation for us to do the work that we do on a daily basis and interact with patients. Max, we go to the next slide. And then the other reason for using projects is to really just kind of build our program into the future. Uh, as you've heard, some of the hospitals have more than just one patient technology specialist or gaming technology specialist. Some have two, some have six. And so by constantly using projects, they've reached that point. We can create autonomy and a broader reach, which is to say like Xboxes, we have 160 of them, 160 of them in my hospital that can reach almost any patient that comes in and I don't need to worry about that. Um, Role specialization really just talks about how all of us as patient technology specialists are completely unique. We all kind of do a little bit of everything, but some people do like more VR work while other people do more 3D printing work. Or some people do more rehab work versus like long-term patient work. So we kind of have to figure out where that goes and every hospital is gonna be different. And then that ties into the inclusion of alternative technology which is to say not your typical gaming systems like your Xbox, your PlayStation, your Nintendo, that's gonna reach into like CCTV or broadcast media. 
VR systems, 3D printing, etc. So all this to say, projects are kind of a big deal in my opinion. And so I'm going to leave this off with an open-ended question of what is technology's limit and how does that limit impact our work as patient technology specialists and gaming technology specialists? That's it. <laughs> I think it's time for questions if we have them. That's right. Well, uh, thank you uh, guys so much. It was really important to me that I included every type of gaming specialist. Um, Andrew, thank you so much. Mark, thank you so much. Alex and Elena, thank you so much. Um, I myself am a patient tip, uh, patient focus, but they're all so important because I feel like me, a lot of the patient focused gaming specialists maybe spend a lot of time as a patient focus, get a lot of dreams like projects, and then when they get a second gaming specialist, they can become then the project focused gaming specialist. So um, everything's really important. Thank you guys all so much for uh, your time and attention. Um, happy gaming. Any questions? Uh, collect data. Um, I just take regular stats, like I just track on my Epic census how many patients I see a day. Um, and then I keep them, and then I compile them like every few weeks, and then I toss them. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's in, a, it's in a spreadsheet. And I think we're about to get rug pulled off the stage. So yep. we'll answer questions in chat and then absolutely. In and gather gather. Hey, this is this is Chris. I'm totally busting in. You guys can answer questions for a couple of minutes. I'll I'll okay. uh, pop in when you see me smiling on camera. That's that's the cue. You guys are okay, good to go. Cool. Awesome. Uh, I, I also wanted to mention um, I've had like members of the medical care team like APRNs and attendings come to me and say, hey, Max, the more you hang out with that patient, the less they're pressing their painkiller button. So I mean, there's data to be taken there. Um, it's yeah, it's still very anecdotal, like, um, and at least at my hospital, we're not able to do that proper study. I know some other people are talking about getting that set up, um, but there is potential there for us long in like, in terms of actual measurable impact. Um, but also some of us are able to chart. Um, so some of us do collect data in the EMR, but also a lot of the time we use Excel. Um, you know, on the hospital, within the hospital computer and everything else. I chart, but my stats are not accounted for in Epic. I have to take personal stats, um, but uh, I am like charting significant sessions and um, we're all doing an Epic rebuild right now. Everybody's going through transition periods and different stages in their position, but um, yeah, uh, we all take stat. Mark and Andrew, you take stats of some kinds, right? Yeah, I do mine on a spreadsheet, but then I also chart, but my charting and my spreadsheet are separated, so I have two tracking methods. Yeah, I just mainly do personal stats over here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, creative with making own video games. We, we're really looking to get our hands on a STEM-focused patient tech at Methodist yeah. who will be able to do a little bit more of that. That's just, it's a little outside of the skill sets of me and Elena. And being in San Antonio, our kiddos aren't quite that level of nerdy a lot of the time. So... I've had one kid ask me to put the Roblox like developer toolkit on a laptop because he did that for fun. And that's the only kid I've had be like interested in that. Keep in mind, they're in the hospital. A lot of the time, they don't want to learn. <laughs> they're not here for, I'm going to do extra schoolwork, which is very hard as somebody with a camp background. I work summer camps after school programs and stuff like that for like 10 years. And I'm like, I want to show you the cool thing. And they're like, how about I just play my comfort game? And I'm like, that that's fair. 